right in and start by discussing our Stand Your Ground on Commission negotiation with Adele. Uh, Adele joined Highland Partners last June and has been a realtor for 12 years. She began her financial career at Fidelity Investments, at, taught at Northeastern University and San Francisco State University as well. She consulted financial or, uh, organizations also. But she's happiest working with people, whether clients or colleagues, as a realtor. Adele is proud to say that her top two listings taken for 10 and 7.25 million have both been signed at a full 6%. So that instantly makes you an expert on this topic. So I'm really glad you're here. Well, uh, and I'm going to ask you for a loan right after the show. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. So let's dive right in because I want to, I really, I think this is something that is important for agents to continue to refine the skill. And obviously, if you're taking listings at 10 and 7 and change million and still getting the full 6%, you've honed and crafted your skill at being able to retain that commission when appropriate. So we're just going to pepper you with questions, and you can give us your great answers, okay? Ready to go. All right, good. So obviously, you're successful at earning a full commission. How do you, let's just start with from at a high strategic level. How do you do that? Confidence. 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 Yeah. You know, um, confidence is the biggest thing and the thing that especially new realtors have to really work on and clearly presenting your worth. My worth is in representing my clients and in negotiating for them. That gives you the ability to say, I need a full, per I need a full commission in mm -hmm. order to do that. So in being confident and standing your ground. Good. So desperate isn't sexy? Is that what you're telling me? Well, not in this field, not, no. Not in any field usually, right? Yeah. <laughs> so having that confidence. So, mm -hmm. And I know some of this is in what we're going to talk about, but right. just pretend I'm a brand new licensee. Okay. And how, how do – I am not confident. So how do I fake it till I make it? Where, where, where can I draw my confidence from? So that when I go on my first ever listing presentation, I, I have more than I would otherwise. Well, some of the things, well, the most important thing is to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Clients, just like little kids, can always see through that. They can see when you're not being yourself. So don't try to be something that you're not. Mm -hmm. But if you're not comfortable, find something you are comfortable with. Si find something that makes you say, this is why I became a realtor, or this is why I do this, this, or this, because you're confident in doing so. You like to cook, as you said mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah. So, so see, your face lights up. You stand up straighter when you say that. So find something that makes you confident and believe in that and picture that while you're speaking with people. When I first became a realtor, everyone out there said, oh, I've been a realtor for 10 years. I've been doing this for 15 years. And I thought, well, how am I supposed to pull this one off? I've right. been a realtor for 32 days. Right. How do you show confidence in that? Well, you don't have to cut your clients, if you're going on a new listing presentation, don't know that. Mm -hmm. They don't know how long. And if they say to you, how long have you been doing this? Or how long have you been a realtor? You can turn around and say, I've been in, working in this area for 12 years now. Mm. Now, if they call you on it and say, great, but how long have you been a realtor? Right. Okay, you can fess up or find a way to talk about that. But they want to know that you know the area, that you know what you're talking about, that you've learned your trade. Mm -hmm. Find confidence in those ways so that you don't stammer. I, I think that's great. I mean, what I really heard you say is all of our life experience, everything we've been through up until today has prepared us for today. It has. And so draw from, if you were a school teacher before, mm -hmm. then draw from the teaching component that is part of residential real estate and mm -hmm. anchor into that, how this is a complex process and it's really about teaching people so that they make the right decisions, and that's something that I specialize in. Uh, if you have a history of sales and you're great at negotiation, then mm -hmm. talk about the importance of negotiation and how you've negotiated thousands of different transactions in your career, not just in real estate, and that's a real skill set that I have and that I possess and that I bring to the table for my clients. Right. Focus on the positive aspects, mm -hmm. because if you're not confident in anything that you do, well, my first question would be, well, then why are you doing this? Right. <laughs> right. If you can't find any aspect in, in the whole process, because it's a big, complex process, where you can draw from confidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. There must be something there. Good. Okay. Next question we have is... Um, as far as setting the table or, or preparing for the commission objection, right? Because mm -hmm. on a listing presentation, there's really only two objections, price and commission. 
everything else kind of takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. And so do you have a checklist to show all the things you provide for free? Do you talk about your 287 point marketing plan or what do you, how, the real question here is how do you show value, right? And so tell me a little bit about that. Well, in, in presenting that, I go prepared with just about everything. Okay. I keep things in the trunk of my car, and I show up with a little portfolio that doesn't look like it has a lot, but it does. <laughs> and you pull them out as you're ready for them. Mm -hmm. So I always bring a signed listing agreement with me, or a listing agreement that's filled out with me. Do mm -hmm. I pull it out every time? No. But if somebody says to you, this is fabulous, I'm ready to sign right now. Well, I don't want to say, well, let me go back to the right, office. I'll see you tomorrow. It, you right, know? Yeah, then you never yeah, get it. Right. <laughs> so come prepared with all these things, but do I hand out a list of my 27 bullet points immediately? No, mm -hmm. I really don't. I think it's more important first to size up who that client is. Mm -hmm. And clients almost always ask you about your commission and about the fees and what you can provide, et cetera. And I think it's more important first to find out why are they asking you these questions. Mm -hmm. Figure out what kind of person they are, too, because although they get to choose whether or not they want to work with you, you also get to choose whether or not you want to work with them. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. And sometimes you have to walk away. I've said on the show before, if you're having a really bad day as a real estate professional, uh, fire a client. Because oh, that'll boost your confidence. It will. And for a lot of times, the reason we're having a hard day or the reason that it's not working for us right now is because we feel totally out of control. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, usually our client roster, right? Don't fire your best client, by the way, everyone who's listening, fire right. your worst one. Uh, but usually our client roster, there's someone on there that's just a big time energy, emotional drain. And so get some control back into your business and, mm -hmm. you know, have the grown up discussion with a client. So yeah. you really go in then to the listing presentation as more of a needs analysis. Like you, you bring in all the tools to the party, Yes. but you're going to pick the tools that are appropriate for what their problem is. Exactly. So it's like when you write something, you have to know who your audience is. Mm -hmm. And so when you go on a listing presentation, you have to quickly surmise who is my audience. Mm -hmm. Are they asking me about my commission because they want the best bang for the buck? because it's a frugal economy, because they want to know where their dollars and cents are going to go, and then they'll be happy when you can tell them? Or are they the kind of people who just want to nickel and dime you the entire way? Figure that out right away and figure right. that out. Is that really the kind of person that I want to work with? Because they're going to be a big drain on my energy. Sure. So figure that out. If that's not the kind of person that you want to be working with and now and then, you can figure that out quickly. Mm -hmm. Why spend all your time trying to convince them if you don't want to work with them anyways? But once you can surmise and say, mm -hmm, this is why they want to ask me these questions and this is who I want to work with, then sure, I'll set the table with all kinds of silver and candles and things and right. tell them that. <laughs> Here you can have yeah, everything. Great. Right. Yeah. So are there a couple, and I'm going to put you on the spot because we're going off script here, which is great. Okay. Uh, and if the answer of I don't know is okay, but I know that won't be your answer. So do you do you have a couple of favorite questions that you like to ask someone who is in a listing presentation mm -hmm. that really help you draw a lot of great information out uh, during your sort of what, I, what I'm referring to, you may call it something different, is your needs analysis phase? Uh, do you have some key questions you ask? Would you share those with us? Sure, I'd All be right. happy to. I think it's important to get people to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. So It's their favorite topic. It is their yeah. favorite topic. And sometimes you'll get, for instance, an attorney or an engineer who will say, <clears throat> I'm an attorney. Great. Right. Get them to talk about themselves and it will loosen them up a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Or an engineer who says, you know, I'm just looking at this from an engineering standpoint and my house is blah, blah, blah. Look around the house. Go for it. If you can't figure anything else about them, say, why don't we do a little tour of your house first? Show me what you see from your eyes. See what they point out. So you have to listen from your eyes and from your ears. What's important to them? Do they have a lot of pictures of their kids out there? Talk about them. Is there something that you see in every room? Is there something that you see that's a, a common thread? Figure out a little bit more about them first. Um, part of it is really just listening to them. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they do. Ask them what their kids do. Ask them what's important to them. Great. So just build rapport 
ask them what's important, really anchor in to mm -hmm. a lot of that. Right. Okay. Uh, Michelle asks, uh, do you go, or, paraphrasing here, but do you ask just really directly why are you thinking about selling or do you sort of let that just evolve elegantly? Or how direct are you in the selling situation? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you, Michelle. I do ask direct questions. Mm -hmm. um, I do sit down and, you know, after you get through the opening icebreakers and, and get to know each other a tiny bit, because that is important. You're, it's one of your most expensive sales or purchases. You should know who you're working with. Then I do ask that directly. Where are you going? Why is it you want to sell your home? What do you think it's worth? And I'll ask them that. Right. I may have done an entire CMA on their home. This may be my second visit. But I'll always ask them, what do you believe your house is worth? And why do you want to sell? And where are you going to go? And you find out their motivation that way, too. Right, right. And, and you need to know that. Right. Helping anchor into the motivation will tell you how the listing process is going to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Next question we have. Um, are you usually successful at avoiding the commission discussion altogether? Is it just, hey, let's jump through some of the paperwork hoops and they're signing it and never, does it, are there situations where it never comes up? How often? That kind of deal. It always comes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Shocker. It always yeah. comes up. <laughs> and, and if it doesn't come up, I bring it up. Good. I think one of the, as you said, there are two key points there that you always want to talk about that they always want to talk about, price and commission. And especially as a newer agent, you sit there and your little heart beat and beats and races and, and your palms get sweaty and you say, oh, I don't want to talk about the commission. That's the part they're going to knock down. It's eighth grade all over again, right? Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, eighth grade dance. If that's the part that, yeah, if that's the part that makes you nervous, then walk in there and get it over with right from the very beginning. That's great. Do the hard stuff first. Do the hard stuff first. And then if they knock you down and, and it's not going to go well, well, there's the rest of your presentation right there. So get the hard part over with. You'll feel much better. And then you can move on to the easier parts. Just to anchor into that, Adele, I think the pieces that you're most afraid of are the parts that you, you should practice the most. I totally agree. So get with an agent in your office. Get with your manager. Get with a mm -hmm. top listing agent and role play and practice having the commission discussion. That's Be huge. Because the more you do it, the better you get at it. Mm -hmm. And the less you do it, the worse you get at it. There's, that is a direct correlative. It's so true. And since there's only two objections, price and commission, mm -hmm. and if for as a gross generality, those right. are the only two objections. So there are complexities, but those are the two glaring conversation points that you're going to have to have. Right. Make sure you practice those a lot and get really good at them. And if you're afraid of it, don't practice on game day. Don't go on a real mm -hmm. live listing presentation for your $7 million uh, listing and have that be the first time in six months you've had a commission discussion. Oh, man. Yeah. No, 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 no. Sit down, grab a glass of wine, sit in front of a mirror, and practice that way. Or Put two on, glasses of wine, if it makes you feel well, nervous. Well, whatever works. Right. You know? <laughs> Put on a Bluetooth, go for a drive, put mm -hmm. on some music, put on a Bluetooth, make sure it's off, and just talk to yourself and practice your presentation, and people will think that you're talking to somebody on the phone as you go for a long drive. So you don't look weird. So you don't look weird. Right, that's, right. That's a key component. That's important. And now with the hands-free and it's built into the car, you don't even need to do that. Then you can talk with your hands. See? See? Right. <laughs> okay. But practice. Practice is huge. Okay. So you, you have the discussion every time, and if they don't mm -hmm. bring it up, you do. Of so course. that we can just say, hey... Here is the rate, here mm -hmm. is why, or do you have a normal setup for that? Sure. Okay, good, good. Tell me a little bit about that from a process standpoint. So just to get real tactical, um, mm -hmm. I'm a client, it didn't come up, I've said, great, we should probably jump through some of the paperwork hoops. Uh, just real tactically, do you sort of go through the listing presentation and just say the commission is 6% and move on? Or do you sort of anchor in and start to build value in it, or how do you handle that? I usually put that actually real similarly to how you just put that there. Um, put it up front. I brought with me a list of all the services that I'll provide for you. I'd love to speak with you about your house, some of the ways that we can get the highest and best possible price. I think one of the things that we should talk about first and foremost, though, is commission. My clients pay me 6%. 
So let's get to the services that I'll provide for you. Perfect. Good. And I don't leave it open to right. discussion. If they want to, and they certainly do half the time, that's great. But that was a cut and dry. Mm -hmm. And it's not a question of, You're not inviting are you okay with 6%? Because, right. I mean, if you don't want to pay me that, well, we can talk about it. But right. be confident. Stand up straight. Look them in the eyes and say, my clients pay me 6%. Right. Next. Next, next question. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So you have a prepared list of the things that you provide. I do. Can I have that? No. Please. All right. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone who's on the show will get uh, Adele's list that she provides, and uh, we'll send that to you so that you can see your, uh, your sample of how you do it. And I, yeah. I really want to repeat what you said earlier, which I thought was brilliant, which is you're going to see Adele's. Don't just copy it. Uh, well, number one, because your name is probably not Adele. but. Mm -hmm. Don't just change the name and copy it that way either because exactly. it needs to be yours. It needs to be you. Mm -hmm. uh, you may offer things or do some process that maybe not is in my core competency or isn't in my skill set. And it would be silly for me to say that I was going to do that. Right. So use it as a brainstorming exercise, uh, not as the definer of how you're going to uh, do your offering for your listing. Yeah. Very good. Okay, cool. Next question. How did you become such a confident negotiator? What, what was that sort of part of its life journey? So you maybe tell me a little bit about that, and then specifically with regard to real estate, how did you become a confident negotiator around commission? Hmm. Around commission? Um, well, I think commission has to, negotiating has, has to do with all of it in your life work, in mm -hmm. who you're dealing with. Um, you start as a little kid learning how to negotiate. I don't want those vegetables on my plate. My daughter is nine months old. She can't even talk yet, and we are negotiating. So, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. That's a big part. <laughs> you get to be a teenager. You learn to negotiate probably not so well, but it, it steps you up there. Mm. Um, Great. College. College not taught me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the teenage years. I may just move out for those years and then move back in or something. That might be a good idea. Yeah, okay, good. See, yeah. I thought so. Just learn to put blindfolds on so that you can't see her batting her eyes at you. Oh, good point. Yeah, I'm going to be ruined, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we should yeah, probably much. finish this conversation after the show because <laughs> I'm going to need help. All right. Those so are different tactics. College. College helped you. College helped me a lot. I have um, my educational background is in finance, okay. so that helped me tremendously. That was a really big part of our education, negotiations, mm. and presentations. Um, from there, I worked at Fidelity Investments in mm -hmm. Boston, mm -hmm. and I was surrounded by some really astounding speakers and presenters, and just not doing the negotiations and that with them, but just being part of it, just being able to listen to them and read from them and how important is the language you use in the negotiation? Because it's interesting that you have talked a couple of times around, you know, conversation and scripts and dialogues and people that you are around. And, you mm -hmm. know, do you, how important is that to you and what you do? I think it's tremendous. Yeah. If someone sits down with you and leans back and says, so Keith, so like how was um, like your Thanksgiving? Was that just the most amazing, cool, huge bird that you stuffed into the oven? Right. I mean, like, wow. <laughs> like, like, wow, right. Okay, how old are you? Right. And what in God's name are you going to do with my house? Because right. Because I, I have a high-end house that I'm presenting here. I want someone who will present it in a high-end fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want someone who can speak eloquently. My house is an elegant house and, and it's commanding of a high price. I want someone who represents it that way too, who can write that way, who can present it, who can stand tall at an open house and talk about its features without saying, that's a really big staircase over there. Right, right. But talk to the features right. specifically, yeah. And I then the benefits, right? And the benefits, right. of course. Mm -hmm. That's That's a huge part of it, yes. So um, what other components of, you know, becoming a confident negotiator? You've talked about college. You've talked about languaging. Mm -hmm. You've talked about process. What other components around negotiation, if any? Sure. Well, when I moved out to the West Coast, I worked in San Francisco's financial district, mm -hmm. and I consulted to pretty big companies out there. When you consult, you negotiate your own contract, you go after your own dollar amounts, and in doing so, when there are so many other people vying for the same position, you have to learn to stand up and say, 
I want that. And you have to learn how to value yourself and present that. That's exactly what we're doing as realtors, too, mm -hmm. is saying, I want that, and here's why I'm worth that. Here's why I'm worth a full 6% commission, and here's why I should be representing your home. I think that exercise of defining your self-worth is really critically important. Mm -hmm. And you know, go to your quiet place, really think about, meditate on answering the question of why should I work with you? Absolutely. And you should be able to do that. Your 10 second elevator speech, mm -hmm. I think eight seconds of it at least should be why are you worth it? Mm -hmm. Why should I pay you 6%? And if you don't think you are, you will not get it. I agree. And if you because think you are, you might. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you might. Exactly. So uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to ask you a question that's pretty direct, and I hope that's okay. But do you only take 6%? Do you usually take 6%? Have you ever reduced your commission? Tell me a little bit about that. No, yes, yes. No, I would yes, love yes. to say that I always take 6% commission. And truth be told, no, I don't always take 6% commission. There, there are reasons for that sometimes. Sure. There could be, um, there could be the house that you're going after where you say, you know what, I will take it for less. I may not tell them necessarily why I'm willing to accept it for less, say a 5.5% commission mm -hmm. or even down to a 5% commission. Maybe it's in your geographical farm mm -hmm. or it's uh, in a neighborhood where you're trying to establish some presence. Exactly. Yeah. There are reasons for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are reasons, not excuses. Yes. Not they knocked me down off the pedestal and they were able to get me down there. Mm -hmm. But the intrinsic value of the advertising I'll get off of this or the people that I'll meet or the neighborhood that I'm in, as you were talking about, sure. is worth the extra percentage and commission. So sometimes you're going to make a business decision yes, and absolutely. choose to be willing to take that listing for less. Yes. But you always start at six. I always start at six. Good. Good. Um, okay. I think that's all I got on that. Uh, in today's market, sellers are questioning your fee, right? I mean, especially as there's more and more press. This is really just starting to come out. But as markets get hotter and hotter, uh, historically, there's compression on commission, right? Because the old, hey, you're just putting a sign on the ground and we get six offers. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, uh -huh. So how do you answer the, hey, you know, Adele, look, we're just putting a sign on the ground. We're going to get seven offers. Like, what's the big deal? Six percent. My house is, we'll even go a little cheaper. My house is 800,000 bucks. Uh, it's a lot of money for putting a sign on the ground. That is a lot of money for putting a sign on the ground. Fortunately, that's not all I do for you. Well, I know, but I know it's not all you do, but like kind of a big piece, right? I mean. Getting the offer is going to be pretty easy. Well, what do you do with the offer? My job would be in representing you and negotiating for you. So if all I was going to do is put a sign on the ground and hope for the best, right. you'll probably get your house sold in this market. It's mm -hmm. in a great neighborhood. It's 800000 It's priced really well. It looks really good. Yeah, you'll probably sell it. Do you want to sell it for the first price that comes in? Or do you want someone who will represent you and negotiate for you and yet get you the highest possible price? Well, of course I want the highest price. Well then, what, what some people really need to focus on here is that in a demanding market like this where you're getting multiple offers, you have even more to lose. Mm -hmm. Because if you're getting just one offer that comes in and it's one reasonable offer and you say just take it, whatever offer that comes in, just take it, that's one thing. If you're in getting multiple offers and I have the ability to negotiate those offers up for you mm -hmm. and bounce them back and forth and get counter offers going out there and really feed that frenzy, you have even more to lose by not having someone on your side to negotiate that for you. So why wouldn't you choose someone who can get you an even better sales price? Okay, I'll sign. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one question I uh, always asked when I was in the selling situation, when commission would come up, yes. and if it kept coming up, because sometimes you handle it, and then it rears its head, and then you handle it, and then it rears its head, mm -hmm. uh, I would just interrupt the process, and I would just say, uh, it's important you make eye contact when you do this, but I would just say, Adele, is commission the only determinant factor in whom you're going to hire? No. So then what really matters is the whole approach to marketing the property, receiving and reviewing offers, getting those offers ratified, negotiating them up as high as we can, managing the inspection process, retaining as much of that money as we can, and then making sure we have a successful close. That's a very interesting point. Yes, because that 
should also be on the sidelines of the 27 or however many list of services that you'll provide for your clients. Right. It's not just, I'll take a picture of your house, I'll put up a for sale right, sign, I'll right. make it look really good. But we negotiate the entire time, mm -hmm. from the time that you sit down and do a listing presentation, that's negotiating. To, as you were speaking about, meeting with the inspectors, dealing with title people, dealing with contractors, getting it into contract, negotiating that contract, negotiating the counter offers, etc. That's your real value. So make sure your items of value that you're positioning for why you deserve six aren't just the marketing or what I'll call the more checklist things, but right. the real skill-based things uh, because it's harder to compete on a skill-based thing, right? It's much harder. Yeah. Anybody, I don't mean to offend anyone here, excuse me, offend anyone here, but anybody can take a picture of a house. Yes, they can. A professional photographer will take a much better picture mm -hmm. of a house, mm -hmm. but at most people, most agents out there are going to take pictures of mm -hmm. the house, are going to put it on the MLS, sure. are going to put up a for sale sign. Those aren't value props. That's that's not a differentiator. Those are things you should be doing regardless, mm -hmm. but how you represent your client, how you negotiate for them, and how you don't give up for them mm -hmm. are the really big value tools that you need to bring to the table. Great. Um, another question from the audience. So what, when you are negotiating a commission in those incredibly rare times where you do go below six, mm -hmm. uh, do you, do you, how do you do that? Do you move in half a percent increments? Do you, how do you handle really tactically that specific negotiation around, you're willing to take my house for less than six? I said, hey, Adele, you know, can, we, can we do it for less than 6%? And what's your answer? First, I would want to know why. Mm -hmm. um, and once, I mean, in my head, I've probably already established the why, yeah. but I want them to be able to say it. Because I'm, look, I'm in sales, uh, and I don't pay full price for anything. Well, that's not really a good enough reason for me, although I certainly wouldn't say that to them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not good enough done. Right. No, 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 no. Um, if you're in sales, mm -hmm. Then you also recognize the value of what I'm doing for you. Yeah, I, I think there's value there, but I think there's also a value in what the other people bring. It's different. Uh, mm -hmm. I prefer to work with you, but you know, if I can get the other person for five and a half or you for six, I don't know. I might take the other person at five and a half. Mm -hmm. Have they already told you that they'll do it for five and a half? They did. When you called them on the phone, have they come and met with you? They came and met, here? and then uh -huh. we had a phone conversation after. Great, and they said that they would take it for five and a half percent. They did, and they haven't taken a listing. You haven't signed a listing. I did because I prefer to work with you. Well, thank you. I mm -hmm. appreciate that. So, so I'm just curious here. If over the phone they've said to you that they would already cut their commission mm -hmm. just before they've even signed a listing agreement with you, then before they have anything in writing from you or anything else, what do you suppose they'll do with your money when it comes time to negotiate it when they receive an offer on your property? Yeah, they, may not, they probably aren't the strongest negotiator, but look, I am. So at the end of the day, I, they're not going to sell anything that I don't sign. So I'll handle that part. But will you be the one negotiating? No, the they'll have the conversation, but I'll load their lip. I'll tell them what to say. I've, I've negotiated for a living. I'm not being very nice audience, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so my real question is But this. that's a true seller. Yeah, and you're doing great with the role play. That. You're doing awesome because that really is a seller that you'll get sometimes. But the question from the audience is yes. sort of how, when you're going to go there, mm -hmm. how do you scale down? Because I've you know, it seems like half a percent has kind of become the default. It has. And I kind of think it'd be neat if agents, and maybe we will be the company to pioneer it, but why don't we go down in a tenth of percent increments? Like, why do we have to go from six to five and a half? I agree. Why can't we go from six to five and three quarters or five dot nine? Great. You, look, you want a discount? No problem. Normally, I charge six. For you, I'll do it for five, five dot nine. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we have to go half every time right away? I think it's because people get nervous and uh -huh. in their heads, they know. Okay, if I go down to 5%, that means 2.5 on each side, and in your head you can work with that math. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I, I do agree that's that. That's a silly reason. It right? is a silly reason. And in the MLS, you usually see things in half a percent movements. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to do it that way. No, we don't. We can, we can make it a dollar amount, too. Yeah, for sure. And so. we can negotiate other things yeah. as part of the commission. I have, for instance, and yes, to answer the question, first of all, I generally mm -hmm. go down in quarter increments. Okay, great. So 3% uh, down to 2.75, et cetera, and I keep the other 3% there. 
Got it. Sure. You yeah. can pay me. We can work on my end on, I believe it's important to offer 3% to the listing, excuse me, to the selling side. Yeah, the Let's buyer's work agent. on my side. We can knock mine down to, to I'd be willing to accept 2.75. Then you're down to 5.75 as opposed to 5.5 or 5 and 3 quarters Good. or 5. So you usually offer 3 to the co-op agent? I certainly try to. Yeah. Okay, good. good. I'd be more inclined to work with a property that were that, and I'd be more mm -hmm. be happier to show that property. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, good. Next question. Oh, well, all right. We've already kind of done this, so uh, we're skipping it. The next question was let's role play, but I've sort of sprinkled those around, which mm -hmm. you've done a great job of, by the way. Those so, are fun. Uh, I recommend that you guys email Adele to be your role play practice partner Anytime. as you're preparing. Uh, so you gave us some just great tips. I mean, really, the, the tips are, are phenomenal. And so some of these we've covered, but the few that we've covered, uh, I think, are worth restating and maybe just giving a little more color to. Sure. Uh, so first, be confident, present your worth. I mean, we've talked about that. But mm -hmm. just, uh, again, one or two tips on, you know, how can I be confident? How can I present my worth? Tell, you know, tell me how to do that. Know what you're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Be confident in yeah. being able to, as I said, stand up straight, look a person in the eye, be willing to shake their hand, and say, my clients pay me 6%. If, I think that if this audience walks away with nothing else, be able to say to anyone, at people in your office, your managers, your brokers, your mother, your father, your kids, be able to look at any single one of them and say, my clients pay me 6%. And pause. Mm -hmm. And don't say anything else after that. Yeah, the thundering silence after that is valuable. It's huge. Yeah. 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 And that also, that also presents your confidence. And if you can't get to the place where you can say that, then you aren't confident enough. I agree. So continue to go down that journey. Mm -hmm. Continue to continue to grow and develop uh, your value prop and what you bring to the table and all the other components. Continue all that thought energy so that you get to the place where you can be confident and you really feel you if you don't feel you deserve six percent you will never get it mm -hmm. that's the truth and people will sense that and yeah. say i don't have to pay them six percent versus exactly. i need to pay them six percent because they are amazing at mm -hmm. what they do even people who would be willing to pay six won't if you don't think you deserve it that's true yeah um we've talked about negotiation at a pretty high level so i'm, I'm going to mm -hmm. skip that one but uh, this is great. I love this. Thank a client who wants to question your commission. Sure. I think that shows you right there that you have an educated client mm -hmm. that you're working with, and mm -hmm. I always do. Adele, can we talk about your commission? Yes, thank you for asking. That's a great question. Yeah. And go on with that. It makes them feel good because nine times out of ten, if they ask you, can we talk about your commission? Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about it as much as you don't want to talk about <laughs> right. it. Right. Right. If they're asking for permission, it's probably going to be a good, if you have a good answer, it'll probably work out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's and you cool. have a good answer. Right. And if you don't, get one. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, we, we use this in part of the role play that we use, and I think it's a good one. If you're willing to cut your commission, what will the sellers think that you'll do with their money? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the key in this process is negotiation. Uh, if I just caved in for you, then I'm probably just going to cave in for everybody else throughout this process. That's what, right. What you want is your advocate who's going to represent you and go do combat for you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I like this. You've used it several times in the role play, and I think it's great. Uh, my clients pay me 6% period. Well, period. you don't have to say period, but well, yeah. it's in the screen. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the beginning of the negotiation for you is to say, my clients pay me 6% and then wait and see what the response is. Yes, because most times, if you've set this up well, most times you can just move on to the services that you provide, what they might need to do with their house, something good about their house, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Good. Uh, there's another one I'm gonna skip down to. The, the well, believe in yourself is important, but I think we've, we've really drilled that one home. But this one we talked about a little, but we didn't give it straight language. Learn how to handle the commissionectomy. Uh, dis dissecting your commission. Tell me what you mean by that. There's there's a couple little tools that you can take away with how to how to work with your commission. Commissionectomy was something that we dreamed up or was in a seminar years and years and years ago of what sellers will do mm -hmm. in dissecting your commission. Yeah. And one of the things, if you finally end up with someone like Keith, yeah, <laughs> the pain in the <laughs> neck from earlier. Yes. Who says, but, 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 
one of the one of the important things to get across to people like that is to explain to them what that six percent really represents mm -hmm. because some people even in this day and age believe that if you're getting six percent that means that you're actually earning forty five thousand dollars right. on a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar house wouldn't that be nice that would be bad if only yeah, well, we don't. We right. don't even make half that. We don't even make twenty two five on a right. $750,000 house. Mm -hmm. So be able to explain that. Sometimes I do that and bring a blank piece of paper with me. I always have that in my, mm -hmm. my stack yeah. of, mm -hmm. of what. Or just grab a scrap paper. It doesn't matter what it is. And take that blank piece of paper and say, here's, here's a full 6% commission. Mm -hmm. And rip that piece of paper in half and say, this is the 3% that goes to my side, the selling side. Mm -hmm. So now you're already down to half a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. From that right there, well, Better Homes and Gardens gets 6% off the top of that, so you rip off a little bit off the top of that. From there, you have a split between my office and myself, whether that be 80-20, 70-30, 60-40, mm -hmm. whatever split you're on, rip that part off and say this part goes to my office, mm -hmm. And this part goes to me. This isn't bad so far. Oh, but I'm actually operating a business because I'm a self-employed person who happens to work at Highland Partners or Better Homes and Gardens. So out of that, I, I need to set aside money for taxes and for dues and for licenses and subscriptions and my car and my phone and the Internet and marketing and everything it takes to run a business. So you rip a big chunk off of that. And then I have myself and my family. So I have a roof over my head, and I have insurance, and I have gas, and I have school, and I have food. And wait, wait till you have teenagers. They no. eat an enormous oh. amount of food. Remember, I won't be there then, so oh, yeah, that's yeah. not my problem. <laughs> and you rip that part up, and you wind up with a really small piece of paper. Right. And say, what part of this, Keith, would you like me to cut? Good. That's a good, that's a good handler. That's or... It. From there, when they're just looking at you like, I'm still not, I'm still not paying you 6%, sure. point to all the services that you do and say, and which of these services would you like me to cut out mm -hmm. in order that I remain in business and am able to work for you? Right. Which of these would you like me to eliminate? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great. Great. Now, this last one, I really want to drive this home, uh, is sellers can walk away from an offer they don't want to accept, and so can you. What do you mean? Yes. Well, also in negotiating here, when you have a house, you list your house, we negotiate it, you receive multiple offers on that property. As a seller, can you walk away from any of those offers that you are not willing to accept? Yep. Can you walk away from anything you're not willing to accept? Of course. So can I. Right. Yeah. And that's the point you want to get across. I'm not begging to take this job with you. You never should. Desperate isn't sexy. It, there you go, right. brings it full circle. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Make sure, I think one of the reasons agents struggle with this uh, is twofold. I think one reason is they haven't practiced it enough. Mm -hmm. And I think another reason is they don't go on enough listing presentations. Right. If you go on two a year and you don't get one of them or you walk away from one of them, 50% of your listing inventory has been eviscerated by making that choice. If you go on two a month and you walk away from one of them, it's just a fraction of your overall business for the year. Mm -hmm. So if you want to grow your confidence, grow your lead generation. Yes. Go on a lot more listing appointments, mm -hmm. and magically you will get a lot more confident about saying no to them. You'll get a lot more confident because you're getting more practice. You'll get a lot more confident because you're opening more escrows. I've found agents are never better than when they have four or five or three or four in escrow or a bunch of dollar amount and a lot of dollar volume in escrow. Yes. You're really good when you don't care as much if that makes sense. You still care well, about serving the client, but it does. It makes you pickier. It makes you more mm -hmm. comfortable. It makes you more confident. Mm -hmm. And then your conversion goes way up. Yes. And that confidence gets shown in every single listing presentation you go on. Right. You need me. I want you. Right. Eh, good. You need me. I want you. That's awesome. Good. Adele, thank you so much. I know uh, how you. valuable your time is, and you've really... Uh, just shared a lot of ton of great information with the audience and I appreciate your candor and uh, also awesome job on the role play so you really nailed those you did a great job thank you so much for your time well thank you too Keith it was a pleasure all right so we're gonna shift gears a little bit now 
And uh, we have Sue Thomas, Vice President of Sales with Fidelity National Home Warranty. And she's going to talk to us for just a couple minutes on ensuring your client's satisfaction. Uh, so, Sue, hi, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. We've had you before, so you're an old pro at this. Veteran. Yes, right. You've got your stripes. And Adele, you're hired you at 6%. <laughs> yeah, good, good. I thought you were trying to hire her for home warranty, and then I was going to have to fight you in our little studio here because I'm not giving her away. You won't get she's her She's one of our clients, as a matter of fact. She's we're awesome. on our team. Yeah, she's great. So client satisfaction with home warranty. Just talk to me a little bit about that. How do we help create that? How do we help foster that? Uh, tell me a story. Well, what I have seen, I manage three and a half states, mm -hmm. and I get a phone call a day where agents um, have either forgot to order the warranty, pay for the warranty, or the, or the warranty doesn't get paid um, through escrow, or agents are now paying for warranties outside of escrow, and the agent forgets to pay for the warranty. Mm -hmm. The other thing I see every day, and I get calls on every day, is um, we didn't put swimming pool on this property, and I have a problem with my pool. We didn't put refrigerator coverage on it. And this becomes a big problem for the real estate agent and their client, and we're the people that are here after close of escrow. You should go away and look good, um, and we can't always make you look good if, in fact, the warranty isn't paid for or ordered. Sure. So to ensure that you're getting the proper coverage for your clients, mm -hmm. a couple of things. Be sure to write in your contract whatever home warranty company you want. Fidelity Home Warranty Comprehensive Plus, plus refrigerator, plus washer dryer, plus pool and spa. Mm -hmm. So don't just put in seller's choice, buyer's choice to be negotiated. Be sure you're actually putting in the coverages you want. That's the first thing. Okay. Second thing is... Because it eliminates mystery, right? Anytime we can eliminate mystery, we eliminate problems. Right, and we're your partner, and so in, in those areas at least where you have put it in the contract and we ask for proof of intent that you at least wanted that coverage, mm -hmm. we can work with you. Right. Okay. I got um, it. So that gives me a little extra... A little negotiating. Negotiation. L right. Topic of the day. Yeah. Uh, that gives us a little extra leg to stand on that here was our intent, right? Because right. a lot of these discussions end up around intent. It all, right. Yeah. And it also means that you actually reviewed the brochure with your buyer. So right. that the buyer knows that they can bring in their own washer and dryer and their own refrigerator and get those things covered. So that's the first thing. Put it in the contract. Write it in the contract and, and be specific. The second thing is, is be sure that somebody orders the warranty. So if you're depending on your escrow officer or your TC, be sure that they actually order the warranty with the correct coverage. You, both sides of the transaction, are emailed a confirmation. Don't just look at it and file it. Be sure that, that what you have asked for actually gets ordered. That will save a lot of secondary problems. And then lastly, believe it or not, be sure it gets paid for. Right. You know, on these short sales and these REOs, sometimes they don't get paid for and it slips through the crack. And, um, and then they, your clients call us and they say, I'm calling for my home warranty use, so our water heater blew up, and we say, we never got payment. Mm. You don't have a warranty. So, you know, you don't crash your car and then call your state farm agent and say, crashed my car, but I forgot to pay my premium. Well, Let's you can, but it won't work. Right. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can call them, but state, even state farm isn't there for that. Right. 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 So, so just be sure it gets paid for. And, and like I said, too, a lot of agents, um, and you probably know the reasons for this, but are paying outside of escrow, mm -hmm. and they forget to pay. Okay. So be sure that if you are paying for it outside of escrow. That you pay it. That you pay it. And if you are paying it through escrow, make sure it's on the HUD and that it got paid. Absolutely. Yep. And then lastly, um, review the brochure with your clients. Let them know that there are optional coverages. Um, often we'll get a call that we meant to have the sub-zero refrigerator covered. Mm -hmm. And I will say, okay, well, if that agent's given us 20 orders this year and one of them had sub-zero and this one didn't, guess what? He probably usually doesn't order sub-zero coverage. If 20 of his or 19 of his orders had um, refrigerator coverage, I'm probably going to work with him on that right. and help him. Right. So just be sure to be consistent. Work with your rep. They're your right-hand mm -hmm. person out in the field. But order those coverages, be sure the warranty gets placed, and um, save everybody a lot of problems after close of escrow. Yeah, I know that when I was selling, I really looked at the home warranty 
uh, I use it as a client closing gift, which isn't revolutionary. A lot of agents have done that. And uh, yes, there's a certain amount of expense with it, which is fine, but it wasn't dramatically more than what I would spend on a client closing gift anyway, depending on the sales price. And it solved a lot of post-close problems for me in the first 12 months, especially with that first time home buyer market segment, because they're used to calling their landlord whenever there's an issue. Right. They don't call themselves and write a check. Right. On that first time home buyer, it becomes, uh, I think it's important on any, but I'm going to anchor in really on this first time home buyer. Because psychologically, when they have a problem with their home, they call someone else and someone else comes out and fixes it. And they are learning about home ownership. And they've never done it before. And so when the refrigerator goes out, they would call their landlord and magically the refrigerator fairy would drop it off within 24 or 48 right. hours, right. right? That's what they're used to. So create that context because otherwise when that refrigerator goes out or when something happens within the first 12 months, they're going to have an experience that's not great. And right. it's not the agent's fault. It's not our fault as an industry, but it is our job to manage clients' expectations. And I found that when I did that, my referrals went up. It was a great up. You know, whenever they had a problem, I got excited because I knew I could dazzle them at right. that point. Right. And then it would be an opportunity for me to get a referral because I'm having a conversation with them. They're having a great experience. And I would turn that into, hey, who do you know that's looking to get into uh, buying, or, you know, buying a home or looking to sell their home in the next 30 seconds? That's a great point. Yeah. And first-time buyers probably can't afford those extra expenditures. It's, it's certainly harder, right? It's right. certainly harder. You know, the, the $600, $800 refrigerator or whatever they elect to get is a bigger impact on that first-time home buyer because they've usually depleted a lot of their reserves right. to get into the home. And they kind of build them up over the next year, right. but especially in that first year. So, Well, I'll uh, tell you, let, let me just interject because sure. you brought up a great point. Okay. Um, you get service cards every time mm -hmm. we fix something, as yeah. all of you agents know. But please do not file them. That is a perfect time to call your clients. We've had agents tell us numerous times that they actually get referrals off of that because you just call and say, hey, I saw that you used the home warranty. How'd that work out for you? For some reason, they're unhappy. Call us. We're going to do our best to make it right for you. So you're a hero that way. If we repaired it and replaced it and they liked it, it's a great time to ask for referrals. Yep. Um, everything's negotiable, as you have heard. So <laughs> if your buyers don't want to pay for the warranty and the sellers don't, maybe everybody can chip in and get that warranty for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Sue, thanks so much for coming down today and uh, helping remind us of a couple of different ways that we can work with you as our partner to get a great result for our clients and for ourselves. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having thanks me. Thanks so much. We'll see you later. All right, my next guest, we are guest crazy here today on the post-Thanksgiving Monday morning radio show. Uh, my next guest is Brett Benzer, and he's the director of culture and charities for the Home Loan Group. And uh, he's going to talk to us about a very cool program that I know a little bit about, but uh, I'm very excited to get to learn a lot more, uh, called Loan to Value. So, Brett, this is welcome, first of all. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Really glad you're here. And this is kind of your baby, right? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, this is your brainchild. This is your passion. You've sort of created this from nothing. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's something we're really excited about. Um, we spent a lot of time over the last few months. We know. means him and the mouse he has in his pocket. Right. No, right, right, no, right. you and the home loan group team. But you, this, you've been, you've been the shepherd of this, right? Yes. Yeah. So tell me what it is. Tell me a little bit about it. So not your traditional loan program, right? Um, but good because they would log off. <laughs> right, right. How many of those are out there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this one's a little bit different. It has a different spin to it. Um, we really want to get the real estate and lending professionals together mm -hmm. to share ideas, make an impact, and get involved in their communities. Awesome. So the way we've kind of designed this is for so that each transaction that the Home Loan Group and Better Homes and Gardens does together, mm -hmm. um, the Home Loan Group will give $200 to a community development program in need. Wow. So the interesting thing is that the Better Homes and Gardens branch and agents actually decide and pick who the community development program is or cause or organization. Uh, but we really want it to be tied directly to the community that they work within. So let me make sure I've got it right. So I'm an agent and I represent my buyer just like I always would. I use the home loan group uh, loan officer. They do the loan through them. and my team, my age, not each individual agent, I don't as an agent get to pick 
do I? Or? It's going to be one um, cause or organization within the entire branch. Got it. So each office, agents and manager together, will decide that they're going to support Habitat for Humanity or a right. local children's shelter or whatever cause that they want to get behind, and those dollars will go directly to that organization. Exactly. Super cool. So we'll come and um, put together some voting and some ideas throughout the office, um, and then collectively we'll decide on who the organization will be. So we, we have almost 30 offices. You could theoretically have 30 different causes. Absolutely. And that's kind of what I'm hearing is that's what you really want because you want it to be hyper-local. Right. You want it to be about solving and helping people in the local community that the office is associated with. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of really great people that work in your guys' industry. Yeah. And um, if we can create an environment so that you guys are connected with what's happening and the impact that you're making in your community, I think that's going to create a lot of value in your business mm -hmm. and, and also in your community. Um, and just to take it a little bit further, um, we will run uh, that cause slash organization for 90 days. So we're going to do four different organizations for the year, so one oh, each quarter. Okay. okay. Um, so that way we get a variety of different um, organizations, different causes, and, and really can spread the impact throughout the community. So you get to touch the community in a lot of different ways, and there doesn't have to be sort of uh, someone's a gold medal on the podium and there's no one else getting a nickel. You'll spread some of that around the community to make sure that you're servicing kind of the whole causal demands of, of that particular office. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know uh, having worked with charities before, this is a question that sometimes gets asked, and no one's asked it yet, but I'm sure they will. Of the 200 bucks, all 200 bucks goes directly to the organization. There's no management fee. There's no nothing on the $200 donation. Right. It's right off the top. Yeah. Um, and so the way we've built it, there'll be a site coming out that we'll introduce to everybody, um, and we're going to highlight that organization for that quarter. Um, we'll show the different impacts. Um, there will be an impact meter that shows for $50. This is what is going to make it, you know, this is how it's going to change the organization for $100 and so on. And then throughout that 90 days, we'll show um, different things happening within the organization, um, how we're getting involved. And at the end of the campaign, we're going to call it, um, we'll get everybody together that um, contributed towards um, the, the project, mm -hmm. and then we'll have an event and, and show how that um, – directly impacted that organization. So if in the quarter four, for example, an office decided to do feeding families and it was 50 bucks feeds a family, uh, you would say, you know, every $50 feeds a family, we've fed 350 families in the last three months, and here's the real direct impact we've had in our local communities through this particular campaign and program. Right. So That's you'll be awesome. able to see as the campaign is going, mm -hmm. um, what's been raised, how much time is left on the campaign, and then even months following it will show um, the impact and, and how things have changed since, um, since the campaign. That's cool. That is very cool. Anything else on sort of this loan to value program you want to talk about? And then I have a couple other questions for you. Yeah, no, I mean, we really um, want to tie it together, buyer, seller, mm -hmm. um, realtor, and loan agent, and, sh and allow them to um, contribute to something that they might not typically do together. Sure. So it creates that bond, that relationship, um, and I think that's going to be a nice uh, tool down the road to connect with clients and your affiliates to continue to share that, that relationship that you guys have built. So Cliff's Notes, use a home loan group rep, 200 bucks goes to the cause, plenty of communication about the various causes. It's hyper-local to the various offices. Right. Can an agent match if they want to? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so that's the goal. They so definitely need to, uh, to grow it further. So 200 um, bucks is sort of the baseline, and then we can grow it however our passions and desires go from there. Exactly. Okay, cool. So I've only got a few minutes left, but I don't want to lose this opportunity to pick your brain uh, because – uh, I've had some discussions with Ron as he was taking a look and having dialogue with you around it. And I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but you really have created this. And you were humble about we, and, and I appreciate that. But you really created this whole cloth. I mean, this is your brainchild. The, the way to deliver it, the way to communicate about it has been created from you. And that is really interesting to me because when I see people who work in and around their passion, 
they just generate these amazing results. And how was that process for you where you have this intense passion around giving and charities and creating change in the world and then tying that to something like won't right <laughs> yeah so tell me a little bit about that tell me a little bit about that process no it was interesting uh, you know I think that um, the concept itself yeah I came up with it um, but you guys as realtors and loan agents and everybody involved um, is, is doing an, an amazing thing in their community mm -hmm. um, and I think that everybody naturally wants to give and and to do great in their community but not you know they don't necessarily have the opportunity or the environment to do so or a vehicle exactly yeah or two hundred dollars, right? Um, <laughs> right. So you know that was kind of the the idea behind it, um, but just the passion, you know, is just being able to uh, to, to make a, a small impact um, and grow it through the entire organization and get everybody involved. So as you meet with resistance, or you know, no, there's never a straight line in these things. So how does that passion that you have for doing it? How does that drive you through or carry you through it? Um, well, I think the passion definitely comes with a natural energy, mm -hmm. you know, it really yeah. uh, creates yeah. an energy, um, not from caffeine or from right. getting a lot of sleep. <laughs> right, just pure but, real endorphins. Exactly. Yeah. And, and like Adele um, touched on today, um, with confidence, it creates that natural confidence. Uh, but I think when you have that, that passion and that energy and confidence, it's really important to be a good listener, too. Mm. Um, I think that That's you'll interact with people that don't come from the same passion or don't yeah. have the same passion. Yeah. Um, and it's important to find out where they're coming from um, and, and learn how to relate with them and, and help them understand your passion and hopefully uh, you can instill it on them. Because otherwise you just start bulldozing people. Exactly. Yeah, we've people all been bulldozed. Yeah, from. like, oh, God, here comes that guy again. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Well, uh, Brett, I, I'm – Cam, I'm proud of you, man. I think it's a super cool program. Um, I'm very thankful that you are bringing this to both the Home Loan Group and to Mason McDuffie and that we get to participate with you in this. And uh, the energy that I can see when you talk about it is exciting. And I'm happy and humbled to get to be a part of it. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so Brett says, go out today and be passionate, people. Um, so take that for whatever that means for you in your world. Uh, but have confidence, be passionate, don't forget to listen. Uh, so that's our radio show for today. I want to thank uh, all of our guests, Adele, Sue, and Brett, uh, providing such great information for all of us. Uh, don't forget, we've got some great events coming up on December 3rd. We've got Business Planning for Success in San Francisco. Uh, we've got reinvention uh, with Debbie DiMaggio on the 10th, and then on the 17th, uh, we've got kicking off your marketing. So tons of great shows coming up for you. Uh, thank you all so much for listening, and as Brett said, go out and be passionate.